Okay, a short lecture on pediatric respiratory. Um, you want to note the differences in between the pediatric airway versus the adult airway. So mainly the uh, infant's airway is very small um, in diameter. So 4 millimeters in diameter in comparison to the adults, which is 20 millimeters in diameter. The trachea increases in length the first five years, but not diameter. Child's um, airway is more narrow, so there's increased airway resistance in children. The only time the newborns breathe through their mouth is if they're crying. They're nose breathers up until two to three months of age. Alveoli are present in the full-term newborn, about 25 million of them, but they're underdeveloped. They increase in size and complexity up until eight years of age. Children less than six use their diaphragm to breathe. Children have fewer glycogen reserves, so there's more rapid muscle fatigue when they are struggling to breathe and using accessory muscles. Um, I want you to think about just a general respiratory assessment. Um, if you're going in to do a respiratory assessment, what exactly are you looking for and what are you going to do? Signs of respiratory distress. Um, it's important that you know those. Um, retractions, cyanosis, grunting, nasal flaring, tachypnea, restlessness. Um, a more long-term effect of respiratory distress, which would be from chronic respiratory problems, would be clubbing of the fingers. Here's a picture of clubbing. So respiratory treatments. If someone's struggling to breathe, what do we do for them? Um, well, positioning is important. You want to put them in the high Fowler's position to um, make it easier for them to breathe. We want to mo measure their pulse oximetry. It should be 95 to 100 percent. Less than 92 percent requires nursing interventions and less than 86 percent is considered life-threatening. Make sure you remove nail polish and move probe every four hours. We can um, give oxygen. Make sure the patient knows that if they're on oxygen that it is a fire risk, so they should not smoke. Parents should not smoke. Um, encourage cotton gowns and avoid toys that induce sparks. Um, we can suction them. Um, their airway is smaller, so the um, actual suctioning uh, tubing is going to be smaller that you use in pediatrics. We could give nebulizer treatments, meter dose inhalers, uh, or do chest uh, physiotherapy. If you do chest physiotherapy, make sure it's one to two hours away from meals to prevent aspiration, and give a bronchodilator prior to the chest physiotherapy. Um, if you insert an artificial airway, um, make sure you realize that the pediatric trach um, tubes are at a more acute angle because of the anatomical differences in your pediatric patients. Now going to more specific um, respiratory disorders. So tonsillitis is the infection um, of tonsils um, caused by a group A strep infection. Um, repeated infections with group A strep increase the risk for rheumatic fever. Tonsillitis can be viral or bacterial. If it's bacterial, you're going to give an antibiotic. If it's viral, you're going to provide symptomatic treatment, so comfort measures. They're going to do a tonsillectomy if it's repeated um, episodes. Pre-op, the patient's going to be MPO for about four to six hours. Post-op, positioning is important, so elevate the head when the child's awake. And for sleeping, make sure they're sidelined to facilitate drainage. Assess for bleeding postoperatively. So if the patient's swallowing frequently, clearing throat, <clears throat> if they're restless, if there's red emesis, tachycardia, then all of those are concerns. Assess the airway, breathing, and vital signs. If bleeding suspected, observe, observe the throat with a good light and a tongue depressor. Diet should be clear of fluids after the gag reflex has returned, but you want to make sure you avoid red colored fluids. Also avoid citrus juices and milk based products. 
tell the patient to protect the surgical site, so no pointy objects in the mouth, discourage coughing, discourage nose blowing. Comfort measures to include would be ice, um, analgesics given on a routine schedule, and rest. Limit activity for up to two weeks. The common cold, um, know it's highly contagious. The duration is usually about seven to ten days. Symptoms, um, gradual onset, cough, congestion, fatigue, sneezing, snore, sore throat, and runny nose. Children have more um, codes per year than adults because their antibodies are not at adult levels until age six to seven. Treatment is symptomatic. It can lead to otitis media because of the more horizontal shape of the um, eustachian tube in children. Education is key to prevent, so hand washing, avoid large crowds, um, treat symptoms safely. The flu is also highly contagious. There's more complications from flu in kids because of their immature immune systems. The symptoms of flu are abrupt and they last longer than the common code. The antibiotics are not indicated. Also recommend the yearly uh, influenza vaccine to help prevent. This is just a chart comparing the symptoms of the code and the flu. Croup is a group of upper respiratory um, illnesses resulting in inflammation and swelling of the upper airway. You'll hear a seal-like barking cough that occurs mostly at night with inspiratory strider. Visual inspection and throat swabs are contraindicated because if they can cause a laryngeal spasm and further the respiratory distress. We tell parents to um, expose the child to moist air, um, run a hot shower and create a steam-filled bathroom where the child can sit. Breathing in the mist will sometimes stop a child from uh, coughing. In cooler weather, taking the child outside for a few minutes to breathe in the cool air may also ease the symptoms. Treatment's going to be racemic epinephrine, which quickly reduces the swelling of the upper airway. Antibiotics, if the cause is bacterial. RSV is the human respiratory syncytial virus. It's the causative agent for some main respiratory illnesses. It's spread by droplets and also lives on surfaces. In healthy children, this may seem like a common cold, but if the child has underlying health issues, it's more of a concern. There's frequent visits to the health care provider. Um, the health care provider will assess the severity of the disease and determine if the patient should be hospitalized. If a healthy child's uh, hospitalized for RSV, it's most likely due to dehydration. This is a nice little slide on uh, prevention, protect your child from any respiratory illnesses. So it's avoid close, close contact with sick people, wash hands, cover the, mi the mouth, avoid you using your dirty hands to wipe your face, clean and dis disinfect surfaces, and stay home when you're sick. Whooping cough, pertussis, is a highly contagious respiratory disease. It is caused um, by a bacteria. It's known for uncontrollable violent coughing, which often makes it hard to breathe. After fits of many coughs, someone with pertussis often needs to take a deep breath, which results in kind of a whooping sound. It can affect people of all ages, but it's often, or it's more concerning in babies less than a year old. This is why you want to vaccinate pregnant women so they do not um, give their newborns um, whooping cough. Cough medicines are contraindicated um, because it um, will not help. Um, you want to manage the whooping cough and reduce the risk of spreading it to others. So you want to give the scheduled antibiotics, keeping the um, infected person home, practice good hand washing, encourage the child to drink plenty of fluids such as water, juices, and soups, 
Report any signs of dehydration to the doctor, which may include dry, sticky membranes, sleepiness, thirst, decreased urination, no tears, muscle weakness, headache, dizziness, or lightheadedness. And uh, this is just showing the statistics of whooping cough. Um, if the infant's hospitalized, there's about a 23% chance that they'll get pneumonia, about a 1% chance of convulsions, 61% chance of apnea, 0.3% chance of encephalopathy, and a 1% chance that the child will die. Chronic respiratory uh, disorders, asthma and cystic fibrosis. So asthma is a chronic disorder. Um, it's a chronic inflammatory disorder, disorder that obstructs airflow. Acute episodes occur in response to a trigger. Bronchoconstriction occurs and there's increased mucus production. Examples of triggers are allergens such as pollen, animal dander, household dust, environmental pollutants, tobacco smoke, chemical agents, respiratory infections, exercise, emotional stress, and certain medications. Your patient will present wheezing, coughing, poor oxygen saturation, breathlessness, chest tightness, tachypnea, tachycardia, mucus production, and um, sometimes um, apprehension and anxiety. Diagnosis of pulmonary function tests is the most accurate to see the severity of um, the disease you want to measure to measure peak expiratory flow rate this is how fast the patient can exhale and teach preventative management so avoid allergens and triggers modify the home environment and early treatment for respiratory infections different medication routes would be a metered dose inhaler a dry powdered inhaler or a nebulizer Meds uh, for acute asthma attacks, uh, remember albuterol, which is a short-acting bronchodilator. It provides rapid relief. Common side effects would be tremors and tachycardia. For a more long-term use, um, corticosteroids, anti-inflammatory, which decreases the airway inflammation and prevents the need for short-acting bronchodilators. Peak flow meter, make sure um, there's a video here to watch, you, to watch to teach a patient how to use their peak flow meter. It's how, how much air, how fast they can blow air out over um, just a second. An example of an asthma action plan. This is how to teach a patient how to use an uh, inhaler, a meter dose inhaler with a spacer. Cystic fibrosis. Um, it's a chronic disease that involves the lungs, the sweat glands, and the pancreas. It can think of it as kind of hardening everything. Um, it's hereditary. Both parents must be carriers of the gene in order for the child to have cystic fibrosis. You'll see chronic respiratory infections, poor weight gain, failure to thrive, fatigue, yellow, thick mucus shortness of air, cyanosis, thin arms and legs, distended abdomen, fatty stools, and abnormally salty sweat, tears, and saliva. Diagnosis is made, um, it's screened for in the newborn screen, so the heel stick that they do on the newborn. They'll also do a sweat chloride test to confirm um, if the newborn screening comes back abnormal. This measures the uh, amount of chloride in the skin sweat. Treatment is going to be respiratory treatments, uh, chest physiotherapy, oxygen, small high calorie meals. You must give pancreatic enzymes at all meals because the body does not produce them. Must also administer vitamins A, D, E, and K. Dosing of pancreatic enzymes is based upon the stool characteristics 
you increase the dosage if the stool is loose and fatty, and you decrease the dosage if constipation is present.